Hello, I'm Marcus Brandt. I'm the head of mission of International IDEA in Myanmar. And we are conducting a series of talks with uh, experts on international law, human rights law, and constitutional law in the context of building federal democracy in Myanmar. And today we have uh, uh, an expert friend from the United Nations, James Rodehaver, uh, from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights who has been leading the work of the OHCHR for Myanmar for the past uh, three, four years already. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, James has a long history of engagement with human rights in transitional and conflict settings. Uh, you've worked uh, in and on Afghanistan, Syria, Bosnia, Kosovo, and uh, many other places that have gone through crisis and conflict uh, in an effort to help uh, also bring accountability and, uh, and fight impunity, but also building structures, state structures that actually can protect uh, and ensure guarantee human rights. Yes. And this is what we want to talk about today. So thank you very much uh, for being with us today, James. And uh, uh, I first of all wanted to ask you sort of when you look back at uh, all of the engagement of the UN system uh, OHCHR, various international organizations at Myanmar, we clearly see that human rights, it's, it's still very much uh, the, at the beginning of uh, effective protection. Uh, where do you see we have made some progress uh, over the years in terms of instilling more of a human rights culture or more of an awareness of human rights? And where do you see sort of the opportunities and challenges in the in the coming months in particular, and years uh, in that regard? I, I guess I would just start by saying that I think that the, the primary area of advance has been in the understanding of the people, uh, of, of what human rights are or can offer, and the fact that they are uh, entitled. Uh, you know, they have the, the, these rights that are part and, and parcel of their humanity. And, uh, and you can see that, that hunger and determination in the people in the way that they have resisted uh, the seizure of their democracy. And uh, I think that's a very positive sign, even if it has led to uh, disastrous consequences for the people. And uh, what I think it has laid bare is just how deep the challenges the people will face moving forward. Uh, that there has to be a, a civil service uh, and government institutions that also recognize these rights and that know, most importantly, how to, uh, how to give um, tangible uh, voice and, and action to these rights, how to help the people to realize their rights. Uh, and that will be the number one challenge for any future transitional government, uh, to build the credibility so that people both understand that government is there to help them realize their rights and then actually have the skills and capacity to deliver. So it is very much a question of awareness of a political culture yes. and also the relationship between the state and the people. Yes. Uh, when we look at uh, the previous constitution, the 2008 constitution, mm -hmm. we see that it actually did include a mm -hmm. section on human rights and it even included a, uh, a way to appeal to the court mechanism to, uh, to defend these rights. Yes. Now, what was wrong with that kind of system or to what extent did this not uh, sufficiently provide the human rights protection for the people of Myanmar? Well, the, the, the problem with the 2008 constitution is, is that first and foremost, it did not address some of the systemic uh, root causes of conflict uh, that had plagued the country for, for years previous, uh, particularly in the role of the military in the country. The fact that it gave a, a protected status to the military, both within governance structures, uh, which, which then effectively made them untouchable. And uh, the fact they were not accountable to a civilian authority. And then that put them in the position to at any time, of course, do what they have now done. 
which is to say we don't like the direction the government is going, so we will take that government away. Mm -hmm. And when the people resisted, they then say, we will then use the force that is our uh, at our disposal to to stop people from opposing us. Uh, and those the roots of that m mis, uh, misuse and abuse of power are in the 2008 Constitution. Now, in terms of the human rights provisions in the Constitution themselves, yes, there are several flaws with that Constitution, particularly in the fact that it does not address you know, the, the rote discrimination against not just the Rohingya community, but they, of course, are perhaps the most emblematic group. But the, the fact that it still you know, protects uh, the differentiations that are made between different communities and ethnicities in the country, rather than guaranteeing absolute equality for all people. So there is there's that issue. There is also, of course, uh, the, that there are not clear uh, separation of powers within the Constitution, that there is not this clear notion vested in the, in the, the Constitution that the judiciary, which is, of course, the primary remedy that people have in the country whenever a right is violated, that judiciary is not independent of all the other institutions uh, working in the country. And that absolutely is critical to ensuring that the remedies that are at people's disposal are effective. So it uh, takes a lot more than just looking at the list of human rights mentioned absolutely. in the human rights section. But you have to look at uh, appeals, support enforcement mechanisms, and in fact, the whole constitutional system as such. So things like uh, uh, the uh, separation of powers, uh, independent judiciary. Can you explain a bit more how exactly a judiciary, a, a justice system, effectively helps to ensure and protect human rights? Well, you know, of course, it's critical because you know, first of all, any time that you have a constitution that that is supposed to protect human rights. It has to be. Uh, it has to convey the full force of the notion that the constitution is there to give voice to the people and to give you know, tangible uh, tangible force to their rights. That has to be the first and primary purpose of a government. Uh, is to to fulfill the rights of the people. Now, some people will say, no, no, the first uh, the first goal of a government is to provide security. Well, security is one of those core. It's an aspect of those core human rights. So it's really about does the does the constitution itself give sort of the 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 right um, packaging, or does it does it properly package uh, you know the purpose of government and and give voice and, and as I say, uh, form to, to the rights of the people. And then, and in so doing, you know, the judiciary plays that absolutely critical role because you can have nice words in law, but the thing that gives them meaning and, and form are, of course, the actions of government. And if the government doesn't act, or if they act in a way that violates the rights of the people, the only, or the pro, not the only, but the primary place that they can turn to to help them regain their rights or to get some form of compensation is the court system, and you know, and that's at the heart of of ensuring that uh, that the rights have force and that they have meaning, and that they're not something that people take away lightly or mm -hmm. without sanction. And, and that's, so that's critical. And now when you look at uh, very complex uh, conflict and transition situations like the countries that you have also worked on, yeah. you have also seen that this is often very difficult to build, rebuild uh, independent yeah. judicial capacity after conflict. So what are some of the examples that you would mention, good examples or bad examples, mm. uh, of that, that Myanmar should take into account when, when trying to build uh, judicial structures for the future? Right. Well, <clears throat> I've encountered numerous very poor examples. Um, there, there is usually a reflex whenever um, there is a transition in place to, to bring back people who had previously been part 
uh, of a governing structure, uh, <clears throat> sort of saying that it's better to bring in people with experience than to start fresh or from scratch. And that often means that people come back into uh, office and capacity and they have not been held accountable for their own failure to do their job in past uh, or to address abuses that they committed whenever they were judicial officials. And uh, so, and that, so that's the first big problem that one has when you're rebuilding the judiciary. The second aspect is making sure that you have people that actually have a, 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 an understanding and a respect for the law as it is now written. And the, probably the first and most challenging thing that Myanmar will have to do in a new transition is revisit its, some of its core legal structures, including the Constitution. So you need to make sure whoever is brought back into office has a full and fully developed understanding of, of what the, the purpose of the new laws to be put in place are going to be. And that infers a fuller understanding of human rights mm. and, how, and, and what are their responsibilities as independent judicial officials to ensure that the government and that the military structures are held accountable for past abuses and abuses moving forward. And, and that is, of course, that implies a certain level of sophistication, of training, uh, and, uh, and, and the capacity also for uh, institutions within the judiciary to hold the judiciary accountable. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, those are several layers uh, of, of checks and balances that you need, or of, uh, at least of a, of a more sophisticated understanding of, of uh, the uh, judicial, ethical, professional capacities and duties that, that the, the new judiciary will have to have. Mm. What also makes this doubly challenging is that you need to bring in judiciary who are ready and capable of trying, in some cases, some very complex crimes. And, and of course, there primarily I'm thinking of war crimes and crimes against humanity, some mm. of the core international crimes. And uh, one hopes that there will be the capacity to give proper advice and mm. training to judicial officials to mm -hmm. do this. Now, as I say, in several places I have worked, it, this transition has been handled poorly because they've brought in former judicial officials. Mm. In the case of Myanmar, I think what needs to happen or what should happen is that they rely on the rich uh, pool of young lawyers and talent to rebuild the judiciary, people that uh, have have had uh, more recent training, mm. that are have had um, a, a broader array of jurisprudential training, so that they've actually been trained not only in the the law and judicial history of Myanmar, but also in other systems, including international legal systems, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, whether it be at the you know the International Court of Justice, mm -hmm. the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Uh, or, or other bodies that have helped national judiciaries handle this problem of, of accountability. So we should probably already start with a massive rollout of a capacity building program for building up this future judicial capacity for Myanmar to be able to exercise this effective role of a judiciary in order to protect human rights. We'll get to the international dimension briefly, but first, uh, I want to ask you also about the role of national human rights institutions, such as a human rights commission. How does that uh, complement the role of a judiciary? Right. Well, the National Human Rights Commission is, uh, you know, it is yet another institution that can help serve as a complaints mechanism, uh, a body, a you know, a, a body that works in the public service, so works in the interest of the people to have an independent voice with an investigative capacity that can hear complaints or allegations of human rights violations and then uh, provide advice to the judicial structures on how those complaints should be handled. Uh, they can actually do a proper investigation. They can bring the process further along so that a judicial system, particularly a judicial system that will likely be beset with a huge number of cases to start out with, 
they will actually ha have an independent body that's looked at these claims and been, been able to say, is this a valid claim or not? Is, mm. there, are there, is there evidence? Are there underlying you know, reasons why this case is much more credible than others? And so it, it should help them approach uh, a variety of cases that involve human rights violations in a strategic way so that a judiciary can actually say, okay, these are cases that should have greater priority or these are cases that we know we can try quickly. Uh, so that's one role of a National Human Rights Commission, to be this complaints body that can already be looking at cases and recommending potential solutions. So, so that's, that's one aspect of how it can work. It's also a body that should be out there working in the public interest to educate not just the government, but also the people on what their rights are, what they can expect to have, and provide advice on the creation of policy. So that, uh, again, whenever you're trying to give uh, you know, tangible you know, form to the rights of people, you know, you're only as good as the policies that you make as a government. Are you properly prioritizing the people who are most in need whenever you're delivering services? Mm. Uh, there is going to be a, a huge need to really put in place a, a social welfare capacity in the country that can look after, help look after uh, the elderly, uh, the, the young, the sick, uh, the, 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 dis the, country, the communities in the country that have been impacted by these years of conflict and violence. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it'll be a question of social welfare capacity. It'll be a question of health, the provision of health services, um, you know, psychological and social health services, uh, there, and of course, education. So uh, the National Human Rights Commission should be able to help provide uh, you know, basic levels of human rights education mm -hmm. and, of course, pressure the government to make the right choices in the creation mm -hmm. of policy. Uh, the other aspect the National Human Rights Community provides is also, it, it, it serves as sort of a, a coordinating center of gravity for civil society. So that you make sure that communities uh, that are served by civil society organizations, that they have voice within the, the, the commission. The commission can work through civil society, work with civil society, help improve their capacity, and also their reach into communities throughout the country. And so uh, th there are a variety of ways that the, the commissions, if they're run properly, mm -hmm. can be uh, a huge help to, to the people, but also to the government. In addition to the national institutions, a judiciary, uh, Supreme Court, the regular courts, and the national human rights institution, there is, of course, the international system of human rights uh, in the human rights machinery of the United Nations, in some areas in the world, also at the regional level. Uh, now, the relationship between international law, international human rights law, and national constitutional law is different in different countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Myanmar, that also is still under discussion to what extent international law will, uh, in the future, uh, have direct effect, for instance, uh, in, the, in the national uh, jurisprudence. But uh, what you, maybe you could already describe is what is actually available to Myanmar already at this point. So Myanmar has uh, signed and ratified a number of international human rights conventions, treaties. Not all. There are some notable exceptions. But the National Unity Government has, of course, announced that it will be ready to accede to, uh, in particular, the ICCPR and the Torture Convention. Uh, maybe you can just describe a bit what would that mean and what, uh, what kind of access to human rights protection does that give to citizens of Myanmar in addition to uh, what is available at the national level, uh, the treaty bodies, the, the various uh, systems that exist, and what can be and cannot be expected from those. Right. Okay. Well, the, the international... Uh, you know, human rights treaty system is is one that is primarily intended to be uh, you know, both an advisory and an, uh, and an accountability uh, function for states. You know, so it's supposed to help um, 
provide states, first of all, more deta- a more detailed understanding of what their obligations are under the different rights provisions uh, in the treaty that they have agreed to be bound by. Um, you know, particularly the International Covenant on uh, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Uh, it is you know, the treaty that sort of provides you with an overview of what the core minimum obligations of a government should be uh, to meet the social and economic needs of its people. And, and then by extension, also provide a framework under which they can report regularly back on how they're helping get better over time. And then this body of experts that services this treaty body and, and, and all the other treaties have their own expert committees. They can then provide advice on whether or not what the state is doing is enough or perhaps other things the state should try to improve their performance so that they're actually meeting their human rights obligations, whether it be on the, the right to, um, uh, to, to, you know, uh, organize uh, in labor relations, uh, the right to have access to social assistance uh, or, or forms of social welfare, uh, you, know, health, you know, the right to, to health and uh, a healthy environment. So some of these sort of core uh, rights that really affect the, the conditions that you live in on a day-to-day basis, these, these bodies can help you, uh, can help the government understand how to fully or more fully improve their performance in delivering the on these rights. Uh, there are also, of course, the, the tr- other treaties that, that Myanmar belongs to, um, such as the, the, the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child or uh, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, where, again, it helps them to recognize what more they can do to address uh, the you know, discrimination against women, how they can better realize uh, equality, um, and, uh, and then for children, of course, to better understand the range of areas where the government should be providing tangible uh, assistance to children to ensure their rights are met. Now, the other function that some of these, conven- these committees provide uh, under these conventions or treaties is they provide a complaints function. So, and what this essentially is, is it's a uh, it's a it's a a port of last resort, <laughs> uh, where if there is a sense that the national institutions are not meeting their obligations to an individual, and these individuals have tried to address these issues in the the national mechanisms or or institutions, and have not been helped in any way, or if their case has not been resolved. They can then take it to these committees and mm-hmm. say, you know, my rights have been violated. I have tried to address this to the government. I have tried to address it to the courts. I have gotten no assistance. And then the committee can actually provide an expert opinion on whether they think the convention has been violated or not, whether the state has violated their obligations mm-hmm. to the individual or not. Mm-hmm. And then so it also provides that level of of accountability or uh, at least uh, a, an additional uh, you know lifeline to the individual if they really feel that their rights have been taken away mm-hmm. or violated in some way mm-hmm. so that that system it provides several different layers then where a state if it's failing to meet its obligations they have ways to, to both seek help mm-hmm. and assistance and guidance and, of course, have a, an objective, independent uh, review mm-hmm. uh, from time to time to say, you know, have you done enough? You know, do you, where do you need to do more? Mm-hmm. How can you do more? And, and then the last sort of one of these mechanisms that are interrelated is the universal periodic review, which is a function of the Human Rights Council of the United Nations, which is one of the, the, the you know, uh, multi-state, you know, uh, bodies or mechanisms of the United Nations, uh, multilateral bodies of the United Nations, provided for in the UN's own charter, 
in which states agree to be examined by their peers, by, by other states, and then they go through not only the different recommendations and guidance and, and advice that's been given by those treaty bodies, mm -hmm. but they also then you know, offer their own opinions mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. advice to states. So it's really states holding states accountable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what that does is it also gives an extra layer of sort of uh, scrutiny mm -hmm. to what states do. So mm -hmm. it, what it means is that really if a government is being um, honest and if it's being, uh, if it's open to you know, wanting help mm -hmm. and seeking advice, mm -hmm. there's no shortage of ways in which they can get advice mm. on, uh, on a detailed expert level on areas where they should focus mm -hmm. if they want to improve their human rights performance. So there are basically these two avenues, the treaty-based, uh, treaty body related uh, track yes. in which governments uh, uh, can even be questioned by on individual cases. And then you have the charter-based universal review yes. where all states uh, talk to each other. But in both cases, it is actually the government that represents that state, that country to the United Nations that is the actor in, in that international system. That's now, cool. how does that work when a country is very, is federal and very decentralized uh, or has autonomous regions that run their own security system, their own judiciary, etc., uh, that are not as such represented in the United Nations, that are represented by, let's say, a union or federal government? Mm -hmm. How does that connection work and how, for example, when mm. Myanmar that signed up to all these human rights treaties, and I presume will continue to be bound by them even when they pass a new constitution, uh, how will that obligation actually trickle down to the new, let's say, emerging federal units, local mm. governments? How does the internal organization of a country uh, get reflected in these international human rights obligations? Mm -hmm. Well, that's where you have, again, it, as you say, it's the role of a government. And so, you know, even a decentralized federal state, you know, it has to have and retain that capacity to, to first of all, communicate effectively with those decentralized units of government to let them know, look, you might be separate, but you have these same obligations that we do. And so... You know, they should be there to make sure that those obligations are clear, that they are helping them understand and, and to, to provide you know, strategic guidance, coordinated guidance to all layers of government, you know, federal and local, uh, to make sure that they understand how they can best meet those obligations. So it shouldn't just be that the government issues edicts or so forth. It also has to be in terms of how they provide funding, how they coordinate the, the provision of advice or the creation of policy, how they bring all of those different autonomous units together around core principles. And that's another reason why I think it's critical that human rights not just be an isolated section of a constitution, but it be the core rationalization as to why the government exists and government at all levels mm. not just the the federal government the chapeau government mm. that, that gets the attention internationally uh, but at all layers of government they realize their power flows from the people and it's their role and obligation to meet the rights of the people mm. to ensure that their rights are not violated to make sure that the people have a, a, an ability to understand their rights and realize their rights. And that to me is a critical role of any federal government, that they make sure that that be the organizing force and power of the policy that they issue, mm. of the coordination and the leadership they provide, but also the, the, the policies that they work and, and the, the guidance they provide. So an individual citizen in any given part of the country, let's say a federal state uh, that has a large degree of autonomy, whose rights may be violated by that local or regional government, must have access to 
recourse, judicial recourse at the national level, uh, but then also indirectly to the international level in order to guarantee their human rights. Well, yes, they should There's have. No they shield, should have. Let's say. Yeah, there should not be a shield. I mean, in the end, uh, a court system is on, only works well if it's accountable to a higher level. Now, of course, at, at some point there will be a Supreme Court to issue final decisions, uh, but you know there should be recourse mm. to uh, you know an appellate mechanism. Uh, that that's a that's a core aspect of of an, what makes a remedy effective. Mm. And have you seen examples of where that is problematic, let's say, in decentralized countries or, or like they just, the, the limits of where the reach of the national judiciary and the local uh, yeah. government sort of match that is probably a very contested area in many countries? Yeah, in, in, um, yes, it is. And, you know, and especially countries that have been impacted by, by conflict. Now, mm -hmm. it, it's, I have to say that I've usually seen that in countries where it's been uh, ethnic, ethnically based conflict, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, internecine conflict where mm -hmm. you have, uh, you know, violence in which, you know, one ethnic group is fighting another. And so they distrust the institutions that might be led by or dominated mm -hmm. by another ethnic group. Mm -hmm. uh, in Myanmar, there is such a common purpose right now among different ethnic groups. I would hope that they could avoid that. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, you have examples such as in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where you have you, a real conflict in terms of how the, the, the temporary or transitional constitutional structures have been formed. And it means that, that there are three separate, at any given time, three separate uh, you know, court structures having to try to work together Mm. Uh, in order to provide, you know, guidance to citizens who, who bring cases of human rights violations. And Bosnia, of course, still also has international uh, representatives in some of its judicial yes. bodies. Yes, it does. As a result of the Dayton Peace Agreement. Yeah. Yes. Mm. And, and of course, that is something that would probably be unlikely to happen in, mm. in Myanmar. Mm. So I'm not sure that Bosnia is ever a useful example. Mm. Uh, in terms of particularly how government is structured. Mm. But I will say that Bosnia perhaps has one of the better track records at how they built their court system and the professionalism of their court system, um, both with an influx of younger uh, professionals and how they worked constructively with the international community to build the capacity of all levels of the judiciary. Mm -hmm. uh, they also had a, even though not as, as good a vetting process as I think they should have, they have over time vetted out some judicial officials that were either incompetent or who had uh, uh, perhaps an unsavory past that, mm. that uh, disqualified them mm. uh, from really you know, being an honest voice in the, the judiciary mm. because of involvement in past violations. Mm. So. Thank you. Well, I think we have to wrap it up already, James. But uh, I think we would like to also highlight the very good resources that are available from OHCHR on human rights education in general, but also specifically on the role of human rights in constitution building processes. That is a document that is also available in Burmese language. And so we will add it uh, as a link to this uh, video. And uh, any other uh, documents and reports that you may share, there is a huge number of reports available on, uh, on the treaty bodies uh, side, the, the whole uh, uh, set of uh, rep official reports by member countries to these yes. various conventions lots of guidebooks about the different conventions. So there is a very rich material available with OHCHR, and we hope that we can also work together in the future uh, for the people of Myanmar to spread the word, to provide human rights education, and to uh, uh, ensure that these uh, emerging institutions uh, following the transition will actually be able to protect uh, human rights effectively. Uh, so. Thank you very much, James. And with that, uh, thank you also to the audience. And uh, we will invite you to 
access, access the links uh, and uh, hopefully you will follow us again in the future. Thank you. Thank you.